You need to understand, what does the vision of being an entrepreneur look like for you? A lot of people, they think, you know what? I like the idea of financial freedom. I like the idea of creating my own schedule. So everything that they're talking about is all these things that have this positive effect on their lifestyle. That's the positive fruits of having a successful business. I need to mentally prepare people to go into battle. I don't want to send you into a gunfight with a slingshot. I need to make sure that you're mentally tough, that you're willing and you're, you've embraced, number one, you've gone through the financial accountability internally. If you want to quit and you're going into this thing full, full throttle, okay, how much dry powder do you have on the sidelines? How much savings do you have? Literally, I, I end up going through their entire budget because I say, look, you got to cut everything out. It's going to take time, effort, discipline, discipline, accountability, sacrifice. Just so many people that are just not mentally prepared for that. So get them in the right mindset, make sure they have plenty of dry powder, get their shoulders squared to the target, and then and then press forward with, with, a, with an intentional, meaningful path. Welcome out there to another episode of Millionaire Secrets. Jeff Lerner, your host, always so excited to get to be here with you and hang out with you. Fantastic people out there and one especially fantastic human who's joining us today. His name is Peter Taunton. He is the creator of Snap Fitness since back in 2003. Uh, started as a, we'll, we'll get to hear about it, but started as a flicker of an idea and now has over 2,500 locations in 26 countries. It's expanded to incorporate a variety of other fitness brands, uh, has delivered over 165 million workouts. I think that's a, a pretty amazing number. Uh, Peter's been named Ernst & Young Entrepreneur of the Year. His, uh, his companies have been named to just about every list you can be named to for, for building great companies as an entrepreneur. Um, he's a massive uh, fitness entrepreneur and apparently a pretty darn good racquetball player. So we're excited that Peter is on Millionaire Secrets. Welcome. Hey, Jeff. Thanks for having me. I'm glad we could we could squeeze this in. Yeah. Yeah. Likewise. Um, I really am grateful. Grateful you're here. You have obviously a, an enormous story, an enormous amount of success. Uh, right before we hit record, we were we were kind of starting to talk about the difference between the the filtered sexy version of entrepreneurship that gets glorified on, you know, Instagram and, and other platforms as well. Instagram's probably the most egregious, frankly. And uh, we're here to talk about the other. And you were saying that's actually why you got into social media, which I was going to ask you because I noticed on your bio that you, you consider yourself a very private person. And yet here you are out there spreading the, the entrepreneurial gospel. So can you talk a little bit more about that? Of course. It, it's... But, but I stepped down. So I've been in the health and fitness space for 30 years. And two years ago, I stepped down as the CEO. And about six months after stepping down, I had more free time at that time. So I started looking at social media. And what I was seeing so much of was just fake, you know, posers, call them whatever description you want. But, but people that are standing in front of jets they don't own, in front of Ferraris they don't own, everybody making it look easy. And it's really... It's, it's people's highlight reel. It's not a fair depiction of, of, of how difficult it is to be, to have financial success in business. And so I tried, I, I put my, I threw my hat in the ring to give people a real uncensored perspective of, of just what it takes to be successful in business. The, the discipline, discipline and sacrifice and accountability that one needs to be able to embrace uh, before heading into to, to business and being successful. So that, that's what prompted me to get into the space. I started doing some consulting and then the, the consulting just kind of segued into a number of different other opportunities for me. I've since been hired as one of the Forbes instructors. Uh, I have a book coming out and all of it is kind of centered around my story of, of how you can, how a kid who grew up in a two-room schoolhouse can build a, one of the largest wellness brands in the world. Yeah, I, I really appreciate that, that sort of backstory like you just described. And, and I will share, um, you, you know, you mentioned you were, you were CEO of, of the, it looks like the holding company that owns a number of fitness brands. Yes. You stepped down from that and thus sort of found the time to get into social media and start producing content. I, I will share personally that I'm, I'm juggling both at the same time. Okay. Um, I'm, I'm actively scaling a company you know, we have some big targets this year. We did, we had 60,000 uh, 
paying customers last year and we're targeting to do a quarter million this year. It's, it's a big enterprise. And at the same time, because of the nature of my business, I'm out there kind of doing what you're doing, sharing the inside look and really hoping to inspire a lot of people about what it takes, but also what the upside is. And my friends, I, I envy you. I, I would have, at one level, I should have done one or I see the appeal of do one, pause, then do the other because it is an enormous amount of work to actually be an entrepreneur and to talk about being an entrepreneur. Yeah, no, for sure. For sure. It's, it's, a, it's a lot of work. And honestly, stepping down after being in that business for 30 years and stepping down, that, that in itself is a real mind check because it felt like everyone was going to school and I was staying at home. I mean, I spent 30 years getting up every day, fighting the good fight, doing the grind, right? Yeah. And so stepping away from that took, took a while to, for that to settle in and find out what my new purpose was. And, and then for me, I'm, I'm determined at this point moving forward to really focus my energies on, on the things that really bring me joy. So I, I, love, I love consulting. I love mentoring entrepreneurs. And, and the beautiful part about entrepreneurs today it's not just, you know, the, I think about the young people in, the, in their in their twenties, you know, and they they want to be they want to get into business, but I I love it. I was just consulting a guy the other day who was who was 70, 70 years old, and uh, he's looking at his next venture. I mean, yeah. I love the fact that people are just they're willing to get at seventy. They're still looking for their next thing. I love it. Right? There's no quitting people. They're just they just grind it and work it. I love it. Yeah, I feel like entrepreneurship, you know, to kind of get to the, the juxtaposition of what it looks like and what it is, is it's not, a, it's not a thing you did to get a result. For me, the people that are really successful at it, it's, and this is why I use the term entrepreneurialism rather than entrepreneurship. It's almost a philosophy. It's a way of being. It's, like a, it's almost like a religion. You don't, you don't park it on the shelf at some point in your life. You'll, you'll be done when you die. Yeah, right. right. No, exactly right. And and people think about, you know, they say, Peter, what are you doing now that you're retired? And, you know, retirement, I don't I don't need I don't even like that word. Right. Right. I tell people, look, I'm not retired. I'm simply transitioning into my next thing, whatever that next thing is, you know, so that that's what I, I look at. It's transitioning. Yeah. Yeah. It's like it's like, I don't know, being a Buddhist or something. They're like, well, what do you believe in now that you're retired? Right. <laughs> well, I'm a Buddhist, man. I'm an entrepreneur, whatever. Yeah, so, no, that's exactly right. So you talk about these college kids and I'm in the entrepreneurial education business. Um, although I work with a lot of adults that are looking at a, at a, you know, a transition or an evolution in their life. Um, by virtue of being an educator, I get a ton of outreach from young people, teenagers, yeah. college age kids. And, and there seems to be this I would say it's a burgeoning, pretty established awareness among young people that like there is this other world out there that they're not hearing about from their teachers, probably not hearing about from their parents unless their parents were entrepreneurs. Um, and it's and it's attractive. And and part of what I think, you know, has made it attractive again is this this overly filtered, non-realistic view of it, but coming through the media. But you know, people hear about time freedom. You know, obviously financial upside, flexibility, the ability to control your own lifestyle, make your own choices, not have to punch in. Um, yeah, I noticed that you, in your story, you, you dropped out of college, right? Yeah. And you know what? To, to that point, Jeff, I'm, I'm amazed that the, so many of the people that I speak to, honestly, probably 80% of them, when they say they want to be an entrepreneur, I talk about, okay, what does that look like for you? Because everybody has a different vision. I think when you're sitting back with people, you need to understand what is the vision of being an entrepreneur look like for you? And you mentioned earlier, they, a lot of people, they think, you know what? I like the idea of financial freedom. I like the idea of creating my own schedule. Um, and so everything that they're talking about is all these things that have this positive effect on their lifestyle. And, and I tell them, look, but that is the fruits. That's the positive fruits of having a successful business. But going into it, I always say, I need to mentally prepare people to go into battle. I don't want to send you into a gunfight with a slingshot. Right. So I need to make sure that you're mentally tough, that, you, that you're willing and you're, you've embraced, number one, that you've gone through the financial accountability internally. Because to me, if you're leaving your job and you're going to start something else, 
I mean, it's one thing if you're going to hold your main job and you're going to do a side hustle. That's one thing. But if you if you want to quit and you're going into this thing full full throttle, I ask them, OK, how much dry powder do you have on the sidelines? How much savings do you have? Yeah. And what is your burn rate? And literally, I, I end up going through their entire budget because I say, look, you got to cut everything out because you got to make sure that you have dry powder. You don't want to you don't want to exacerbate the situation by the challenges of growing a business because it's going to take a lot. It's going to take time, effort, discipline, accountability, sacrifice. Right. And there's just so many people that are just not mentally prepared for that. So get them in the right mindset. Make sure they have plenty of dry powder, get their shoulders squared to the target and then and then press forward with with a with an intentional, meaningful path. Yeah, you know, talking about the, the, the compounding value of reducing your burn rate, I was reading something kind of interesting this morning. I'm doing some research for a, a course I'm putting together, and it was talking about, uh, it was about Warren Buffett and Charlie Munger, you know, the two partners at Berkshire Hathaway, and it was like, the question was posed, like, why is Charlie Munger worth so much less than Warren Buffett? You know, Warren Buffett's worth $80 billion dollars you know, Charlie Munger's no slouch. He's worth $2 billion. Yeah. But it's like, they're visibly doing the same work. Like, what's the difference? And it basically, the, the, two, main, um, the two main observations were that one, uh, Charlie Munger gave away some of his wealth during, more of his wealth during his life. Uh, whereas Warren Buffett, he just focused on building and building capital because he said, I'm so good at making money. My money will do better the more I can build it and not give it away when I'm, you know, die or close, you know, in the latter phase of my life. But the other big observation was Charlie Munger had more kids. And so his cost, of, you know, it, it's, it's ridiculous or it's silly now to think of billionaires having to buy books for their kids or yeah. whatever. But 30, 40 years ago, having six kids that you had to buy school lunches for rather than maybe two. Literally, that's one of the main explanations now for a $78 billion discrepancy. And yeah. that's, that's the impact of what seemingly more minor expenses compounded over time in the early stage. So to your point, you got to eliminate everything you can when you're starting out. Just, just do the best you can to go into it in the best position to win. And because there's nothing more stressing or demoralizing as a, a, when you're trying to launch a company is being cash strapped. Yeah. Not only the business financially strapped, but you personally financially strapped. Because if you're personally financially strapped and you're working for this business that you're trying to launch, you're always thinking about how can I pull money out of this business to support my lifestyle and just pay for my basic necessities. It's just another mindset rather than having some dry powder on the sidelines. So you can double down when opportunities present themselves. Mm -hmm. and, and maybe to your analogy with Warren Buffett, you know what, Warren Buffett, not having six kids. I don't know that six kids are that much, are going to make that much of a material difference in the big picture of things, but definitely Warren had more time to yeah. focus, to focus on, on, opportunities and seizing opportunities. And one thing that Warren does really, really well is getting his money working for him. So his money, it doesn't sit quietly. He doesn't leave it sitting in a bank. He's got it working for him. Things that are paying him a dividend. And when he gets those dividends, he gets that money working for him. You know what I mean? He's not pulling it in. Now there's a time for all of us. I mean, for me, in my, in my case, you know, I made sure when, when I stepped away from, from my company, but I've had, I've had a couple of liquidity events with my company. I'm still, I'm still, I still own about 30% of my company, but, but I've exited, I pulled hundred million out of my company. So I'm not, I made sure that for me, that it's not, and I've divested that into real estate and a number of things where I've got cash flow coming in. So I'm not worried about cash flow. It doesn't affect any me. And then my other large nest egg is just compounding. It's in a number of different things that are very diversified. So I'm not to a place yet where I say, hey, look, I'm not going to work anymore. I'm just going to pull a stipend out of my proceeds. I don't do that. I'm, I'm kind of a Warren Buffett a mentality of I like every dollar working for me. I have a certain yeah. lifestyle that I live, but I don't, uh, you know, I, I don't waste it. And I'm not wasteful. I guess is what I say. Well, that's kind of the nice thing about being an entrepreneur is like, at least I can only speak for myself, but it sounds like you might be the same way. Like 
this idea of this idyllic sail into the sunset retirement, it, you know, I feel like a lot of people that if they're in traditional employment, they're planning for 20 years of not working. That's kind of the goal. Whereas us, like I, I'd go in, I can't do 20 minutes without working. I go nuts. So there's no need to convert it into this passive vehicle. It's better to just keep growing it. That's, a, and you know what, Jeff, that's a great point. I'm glad you, that you share that. And, and, you know, a lot of people don't understand that work can be fun. You can, yeah. enjoy, you can enjoy what you do. I genuinely enjoy, even the 30 years that I ran my company, I really loved going to work. I remember some weekends, I couldn't wait for Monday so I could get back in there and, and see the people and get right back and just fighting the good fight every day. So, you know what? Find something that you love, and it's so cliche, but find something you love, you'll never work a day in your life. There's some truth to that. And doing something you love in a company that you own, I can tell you, you know, I hope for every one of your listeners out there that you have an opportunity to experience that at some point in your life. And I don't care if it's a, if it's a lawn mowing business, a cleaning business, or, or you're building a large empire. That idea of employing people and and vicariously experiencing all the wins that every one of your employees, yeah. I, I loved it. When my when my employees would would buy their first new car, you remember when you bought your first new car? It has that that fresh kind of glue smell. You know, it's brand mm -hmm. new. That or when or when uh, one of my employees buys their first home or they're getting married to have their first child. Every one of these little milestones bring me back to that point in time in my life. So I get to vicariously experience all that stuff. And that's just the bonus of, of, of working with great people and, and, and building an amazing company. Yeah. I mean this, you know, in, in my current business, Entra, we've been, it's been a little over two years since it was, you know, I first had the, the inception moment and said, Oh, let's do this. And so the first year was, I, I didn't take, I didn't get paid for over a year and it's just grind and hustle and make it happen and value innovate and all that. But this it. year we paid out some really nice Christmas bonuses. I love it. It is the best feeling the yeah. best. And, and to your point about Mondays, I actually, um, you know, I chime in on the Slack channel with the company and everything. And I have a, a thing I'll chime in TGIM. Thank goodness. It's Monday. Right. Right. Um, right. The TGIF notion, that's, that sounds so depressing. Why, why yeah. live, I mean, what's two sevenths, 28 point six, yeah. roughly 28.6% of your life. Why live 71.4% of your life hanging yeah. on for 28.6% of your life? 100%, right? I mean, it's just no way, to, it's no way to roll. It's no way to roll. And, but it's tough and people do it every day. I, I talk to people, you know, not every day, but certainly weekly, people that feel like they're stuck. They yeah. feel like they're stuck in their life. They're stuck in their life. And, and, and that's a, a number of things bring people to that point. Sometimes it's relationships. Sometimes it's a relationship coupled with lack of cash flow and, and then doing something that they don't like. I mean, you think about it. You're struggling in your relationship. You're in a job you don't like and you don't have enough money to do anything. So yeah. you feel like, my gosh, what do I do? And that's, I deal with a lot of people that get like that. And it takes courage to pivot. OK, you can't just say, I'm going to get into business. Look, that sounds great, but that's not the answer. OK, you don't just wake up one day and say, I'm going to be an entrepreneur. Well, OK, well, what do you want to do? you got to figure out what it is that's going to be that's going to light that fire for yourself, that you're willing to get up every day early and go chase it down. Right. And that yeah. you're just going to you're going to put in the extra time and run out every ground ball because that's what it takes to win. There's no easy money out there today. And that's the and that's the punchline with social media. There's so many of these of these people on social media and it's not just kids, it's adults, too. Adults suck just as much as the kids. They're just the, the narrative is so false. Right. It's so false. And some of these individuals, I know them. it's that they're the biggest freaking fraud on the planet, right? It's just a big sham. Hey, let me show you how to make money. Subscribe to my channel. Give me $29.95 a month and I'll show you how to be a million. You know, it's just bullshit. Right. That's the kind of stuff that drives me crazy. Yeah. Well, it, I mean, it does me too. I, I, I like to say to the extent that, and, and, oh, I just, I, I abhor this term, but if it, you know, I've had a few people say Jeff's my guru and I'm like, no, I'm the anti-guru down with gurus. It's a, it's a detestable concept because anytime people are caught up in 
you, that term where there's almost like this sort of, um, what would the word, ide, ideal, idealization where you're idealizing this thing, this person, like there's this, yeah. uh, you know, reverence factor. It's like, you've removed all the realism from it. And if anything, we need way more realism. It needs to be a way grittier conversation. It needs to be like talking about becoming a Navy SEAL. Right. Now, that, and that level of, of discipline. And that's great. You know, when, if, 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 when people say that to you, Jeff, that, so, I mean, you're, you're a well-spoken individual. So that, that's one of your gifts, being able to share that you're able to articulate your narrative in a way that's relatable for people. And because if your narrative is not relatable, then it doesn't that it doesn't resonate. Right, right. And that's the problem. But if you're if you're if you're if you're humble and you're down to earth and you say, look, I've been down that path before, and let me tell you how it how that story ends for me, and and here's what I wish I had done differently. So being able to be vulnerable with your listener base because you know what, every entrepreneur, I always I always say if you if you're not failing, you're not trying hard enough, right? Yeah. Because that is part of winning, and and all of the. All of the, the, the learning experience come from times of adversity, fighting through challenges. That's when you're really pressed. Anyone can run, a t- can run a company with the wind at your back, smooth sailing, easy peasy. Anyone can do that. But when you have some challenges, the dynamics within the marketplace change. Look, look at what's going on right now with COVID as an example. There's been a lot of companies that have had to reinvent themselves and kudos to the, to the, to the vision, the CEO who are, or whoever is the vision of the company to, to, to have enough, enough wherewithal to say, look, we don't know how long this is going to be, but if we stay down this path, it's not sustainable. We need to pivot. And, and there's been a lot of great companies that have been made along the way. And, uh, you know, one of the things you said, um, you said talking about finding that thing that'll, that'll really like rev you up, fire you up to go run out the ground balls and do that work. I think the other thing that has to be said, coupled with that is it has to be something that also equally, if not greater, fires up the market or some segment of the market, you know, being super excited about an idea in, in and of itself is, is not a sufficient reason to start a business. You have to know you know, what you need to be excited about is the fact that you know how to solve someone else's problem. Yeah. And that's a, and that's a, a great point. And I, I talk to people constantly about that as well saying, look, Finding something that you love, okay? I mean, and I'm, I'm just going to take something as, as basic as a coffee shop, okay? Right. I want to open up a coffee shop. Well, if you're going to open up a coffee shop in Miami, I promise you there's one on every corner, okay? So you have to be more than just coffee. So you've got it. You can't just be another me too. So what are you going to do? Because you're dealing with some big, some giants within that space. What are you going to do to be different? What are you going to do to make your place that place that I want to stop and have my coffee as opposed to, as opposed to rolling into Starbucks? Is it the vibe, the energy that I feel when I come in? And there's a lot of people that have done it really well. In fact, in Miami here, there are some really cute, quaint little coffee and tea shops. They have great, great bakeries in them. Great, mm-hmm. cool vibe when you walk in. And it's a great place to go and have a, a meet with friends or have a, a, a small business meeting. It's the right vibe because it's not a revolving door. It's not like a Starbucks where they're just herding people through like cattle. So it's a little bit friendlier vibe. And, but without the vibe and the ambiance and the furniture and the, the layout, without that vibe, it wouldn't win. So they've yeah. done a great job of saying, look, I may be selling coffee, but I'm also selling an experience. And, and that's, that's what you have to think about. Because some people think if they're getting into business, they have to think of something that's never been thought of before. That's really hard to do. Just take something that's there and say, how can I make that better? And that happens every day, every day. Yeah. So I, I want to back up and, and, and I want to, you know, I don't want to take for granted. Like I've got, I feel like I know you to some degree because I've been doing research on you because you were coming on my show. Right. Mm-hmm. And, and I, I know your brand. I know Snap Fitness. Um, but I don't want to assume that for everyone else. You have a really amazing story. Uh, I kind of want to go back to the college part of your life. If I understand it right, you, much like, I, I'm a high school dropout, by the way. Congratulations, you actually got to college before you made that decision. <laughs> um, you, you know, you were frustrated in a class and you dropped out and correct me if I'm wrong, but you went and started playing a bunch of racquetball instead of, in lieu of telling your parents, right? Yeah. That, that happened? And I think, I think for context, and this is important for everyone, I, and I just want to set the record straight. I, I'm not a trust fund baby. I grew up youngest of seven kids with an identical twin. 
All right. Youngest of seven kids. I grew up in a two room schoolhouse. My father had a grocery store in my hometown and I, and I had the opportunity to go to work when I was eight years old. So that was my little hustle. Okay. Um, I started playing racquetball at an early age and became a professional player. By the time I was 18, I was a sponsored pro and, okay. and, and I was going to, co- going to college and, and playing racquetball. Right. And, um, cause racquetball tournaments are pro- predominantly on a weekend. And I was studying business statistics, having breakfast with my twin brother. And I just said, man, now, you know what? I didn't come from a family of money. And my, my parents said, Hey, look, you want to go to college, go to college, but we're not paying for it. Right. So I, I had about, $12,000 of student loan debt. And I'm thinking to myself, uh, this is kind of funny, Jeff, I'm thinking, my gosh, I'm going to be 80 years old before I get this thing paid off. Right. I mean, because I had no perspective because I, I never had any real money. Right. So I just said, I'm out. I read, I'm out. I was studying business statistics. I closed my book. I said, screw it. I'm out. I said that to my twin brother, but 30 seconds later, he looks at me and says, I quit too. <laughs> and we quit. We never told our parents and we continued to play racquetball through the rest of the semester. We lived in the dorms and, you know, it, it worked out for both of us. You know, he went on um, to, to start, to start a, a shoe business, a shoe store, and it ended up selling it to Foot Locker and oh, cool. you know, which is a story in its own right. And, uh, and then I went on to, 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 you know, create a fitness empire. Well, we'll have to get your, your brother on the show too. I'd love to hear that story. Um, but, and to be clear, I just, I just want to sort of nip in the bud any, you know, d- delusions people have about what it means to be a sponsored racquetball player. I'm guessing they weren't paying you like six figures a year to play racquetball. No, it was no. probably mostly like free gear. Yeah, yeah. Free, free gear, some travel and accommodations. But, um, you, you know, you would be playing in, in, in tournaments, you know, th- three weekends a month. Right. And then if you're not playing tournaments, you're doing like if a new if a new club would open up somewhere, they would bring the sponsored players in to put on an exhibition in a clinic. So mm-hmm. that, that was generally pretty decent money. But you couldn't believe me. That's you weren't going to get rich. out. You're not going to make a career out of it. It was just for me. I love the sport. It allowed me. To, it gave me the opportunity to travel growing up in a small town. I, I didn't have that opportunity. Mm-hmm. So being able to travel around. I, I love that. And uh, and I love the fact that I was I was good at it. I was a good player. So how were you able to parlay? Again, you drop out of college, um, you're playing racquetball. I'm, and it's funny, I had a guy on the show, Mikey Taylor, who had a similar experience. He was a professional skateboarder. Okay. And it's a, it's a similar sport where you get sponsored, you become well-known within that you know, niche, but it's not like being a professional basketball player or something, right? right. You're not, nobody's giving you a million dollar signing bonus. So yeah. I assume that fi- money was still scarce, it was. And I had an opportunity. I was at the time I, I, I moved from Minneapolis down to to Orlando, Florida, and I was playing the Sun Belt. And before I left the club that I played at all the time as a kid, I, I told the owners of that club. And that was a club that was struggling. I knew that because being a pro, I got to know I knew the owners and I knew that the club was financially struggling. And I told the guys, look, if you ever want to turn this club around, give me a call. And and then I moved to Orlando a year and a half later, my phone rang and it was these guys. And they said, we'd like you to come and, and turn our club, turn this club around. Here's the deal. We'll pay you $16,000 a year. But if you turn it around, we'll let you buy us out with the profits that you generate. Because these guys have been feeding this club about $250,000 a year. Hmm. So every year there was five owners every year, every one of these guys would be throwing 40, 50 grand into the bucket just to cover cash flow. All right. So they were fed up with this thing. It took me eight years. Now here, here's another great lesson for your, mm. for, for your, your audience. So for the first eight years, it took me eight years to turn that club around and, and have enough equity where I could, where I bought everyone out. So now think about it. I was 22 when I started. Now I'm 30. All right. I, I own this club free and clear. And, and, and now that the club is making about 200 grand a year profit. All right. Mm. So I could have sat there, but I didn't, I doubled down. And I went to that same bank, I got a loan and I built another club. So I did that seven times over the next 10 years. So mm-hmm. now I'd been in the business for 20 years. I sold, I sold those clubs and I had about $3 million in the bank. So that was my life savings at that time, Jeff. Think about it, I was 40 years old at the time. I had 3 million in the bank. That was my life savings. I thought I was doing pretty good, okay? And then I, and then, I had the idea to start Snap Fitness. Now, it's never too late. This is important. At 40 years old, I started my company. 
it, I had the right product at the right time. Within five years of starting, I opened my first club in 2004. In 2009, I took my first bite of the apple. For any on your listeners out there, a bite of the apple is when you start a company and it's time to take some chips off the table. Yeah. I promise you, every one of you entrepreneurs out there, don't make the mistake of starting a business, riding it all the way to the, to the crescendo, and then riding it like a toboggan down the other side. It happens every day. Don't be greedy. So along the way up, take some chips off the table, but make sure that it's going to be meaningful for you. So in five years of starting the company, my company was valued at $100 million. I sold 40% of my company for $47 million. That $47 million left, came to me, it went right into my personal checking account. I didn't need it, for, I didn't need it to grow the company because I was flush with cash, okay? Mm-hmm. So the, the, I, I, now I'm still in control of my company, so I didn't give up control. I sold 40%. I'm still in control of the company. Over the next five years, I took the company and doubled it in value again. I valued it at 200 million. I took another bite of the apple, okay? Yeah. Once again, it's a good time. I, I sold another percentage of the company for about the same amount and then went ahead and ran the company for a few more years before, before stepping down as a CEO. But for me, the, you know, the company now with COVID, it, it struggles a bit, but they'll come out of it. But, but, but everyone is struggling. But the, the, the moral of the story, the punchline is, you know, take strategic bites of the apple along the way. It's the prudent and the responsible thing to do. And you owe it to yourself as an entrepreneur because winning in business, it's hard to do. You need to be rewarded. Yeah. And I'm curious. So I'm thinking through that timeline. You started 2003, 2004. You said you took your first bite five years later. So that was, that was mid great recession. Yeah. 2009. Yeah. So, so you were able to get that valuation uh, mid great recession. How much did the, that, that big recession at that time impact the company? None. I mean, that was the, what, what you, what we had was the, that was when the, the, the banking bubble burst. Right. That right. Was all the, right. So, I mean, it happened. Remember in all three, you had the dot com burst. Right. Okay. So these things happen periodically, you know, dot com burst in all three, you know, 2009, the, the, the banking crisis. Right. But we didn't need, our stores were performing at a high level. It actually hurted our vendors more than it hurted us because Mm -hmm. the vendors suddenly had less access to capital to buy steel, to make equipment, et cetera, et cetera. But we were still, we were growing at, you know, rocket, rocket speed, you know? Well, yeah. And, and, and the fitness industry, that's not an inventory heavy business. You invest in your equipment, you invest in your facility and you, and you pay for your people, but like, you're not having to keep a million dollars of product on the shelf. No, no, rather, that's right. It's, but it's the, the fitness space, it's capital intense on the front end. Yeah. So that's when you're, you don't, you can't kind of limp in, in the fitness space. You can't limp in. You kind of do have to do a sailor dive in the deep end of the pool because you've got, you got to have equipment and that's capital intense. It's got a long shelf life, you know, before right. you start replacing things, but still, nevertheless, you're in, you're in the game. So I'm curious with the vision of Snap Fitness, and, and, and actually before I ask it, it begs mention that you know, you're 40 years old, you had 3 million bucks in the bank. This was, I don't know how old you are now, but you know, it sounds like 15, 20 years ago, close, you know, between 15, and 20 years ago. Uh, I know a lot, and, and it's ironic, I was 39 when I started Entra, not at a super dissimilar place. I sold my agency for multiple seven figures and I was kind of at that same place where it's like, I could... I could probably figure out how to ride this out. Yeah. But no, no. And same thing for you. You're like, no, I'm, I'm, I've established a track record at this point and I still got half a lifetime left. Right. Um, but what, how much trepidation did you have about essentially betting your nest egg on the next thing at a point, at a point where you could have cashed in if you wanted to? Well, when, when I made the first, I was cautious, which I recommend for everyone. I mean, I, I built one club. The first club I built, I built it in an urban market. And I was pleasantly surprised. It was a significantly smaller footprint than the clubs I had owned previously. Mm-hmm. And, and I eliminated like swimming pools, climbing walls, uh, child care, racquetball courts. So I, I, I stripped this thing down from 40,000 square feet down to like four to 5,000 square feet, one tenth the size. Instead of 50 employees, I had two. Huh. So I, I built one club. And, and I put in an urban market. I sold enough memberships in 90 days to cash flow for the year. Now, when that happened to me, Jeff, I was pleasantly surprised. 
I said, you know what? I like this. I'm going to do it again. Okay. Now had that first club failed, then I probably would have been less, less um, eager and enthusiastic right. about opening another one. I did one then in a mid-size market and it performed the same way. Now, now I'm really intrigued. I've done two in two different markets. The product is performing. The third one I built, I put it in a town of 3,500 people. And I'm not kidding you when I tell you it was a one stoplight town. Okay. It is a little rural community, 3,500 people. I thought I'm going to, I'm, I'm for sure going to lose my ass in this one. Right. It performed the same way. So now I took a step back and I said, the unit level economics work regardless of the market that I put it in. So I knew the product could survive through diversity. Yeah. Well, it was at that point, Jeff, that I knew that I had a tiger by the tail. And that was when I doubled down. That is when I felt comfortable because I had validated it quietly on the sidelines. And then I, I went ahead and got my, my franchise disclosure documents. I had great attorneys do that. And then I was all in. And literally four years from, from that day, I was opening my, my, my best year. I opened 377 new stores in one year. I was opening more than one store a year, not, not signing a lease. I'm talking about physically open a store where people are inside exercising. So you're and, like, it's like in the morning and you're like, Oh, I'm at the grand opening in Poughkeepsie, New York. And I got to charter a jet because we're opening later today in Miami or something like that. It, it was impossible. It was impossible. You could never go to every opening. Yeah. It was impossible. You know, the, the when, when I would go into a new country, then I would go in there and do a ribbon cutting at that country for the first store opening, something mm -hmm. like that. But today, and then when you think about, when you think about um, seizing opportunity. So in the dot, in, in the banking crisis, Coming out of that in 2009, there was a lot of people that had battle wounds coming through that. I was flush with cash. I had no debt. Okay. I was printing money. So when everybody else was ducking in their foxhole, I was standing up taking shots. Okay. Yeah. And I made some acquisitions and, and, and made some really great strategic moves. And, and so today I own, there's three, I have three brands and across those three brands are 6,000 locations or licenses in 28 countries. Hmm. So it's a big business. It's a beast. Yeah. Yeah. It sounds like it. I'm, uh, I'm curious. Um, you know, I always talk a lot about having a big villain. Like if you want to build a big business means you need to be a big hero, which means you need to battle a big villain. Yeah. Um, okay. and so I can see in the urban market, I would assume your big villain was the big box gyms. You'd be surprised. I mean, Every, every gym that opens, everybody gets, everybody gets a piece of the action. Some take more, but everyone's your competition. I mean, you, at the end of the day, it's not about faster treadmills, heavier weights. It's about the community and culture that you can generate within your four walls. Okay. And so it's really about that. And, and, and that comes with people. So for us, everyone was a competitor and that's how you have to look at it. You got to look like everybody is the enemy. And you gotta, and you gotta wake up every day. And I think that, that this is a great fuel for you. You gotta wake up every day thinking that somebody's trying to steal it. Yeah. Who's trying to take it away from you? That the, I mean, I ran my company. I ran my life, and even I have a little bit of that today. That I always, I, I've got this little paranoia that I feel like somebody's gonna try to take it all away. And I don't know if it comes from growing up with nothing. I don't know where it comes from, but I use it to my advantage. I use it to hold myself accountable and disciplined. And I know that what I've done over the last 30 years in business, it's worked for me. And it's, it's not just that I've made good choices, but I had the right attitude. I had the right discipline. I held myself accountable to win. Yeah. Well, that's, you know, we mentioned Charlie Munger. Um, one of the things he says is that if you don't, if your contingency plan doesn't account for the absolute worst thing that could possibly happen, then it's not a contingency plan. It's just, it's just kind of a hope. Exactly. And hope is not a business plan, right? <laughs> yeah, hope, amen. Is a, hope is not a business plan. And I always tell people for all you sport fans out there, I said, you know what? You might win a game here and there on a Hail Mary. You'll never win a season on Hail Marys, right? right? It, just, it won't happen. So, you know, quit, quit swinging for the fences. Every time you get up there, be practical and don't bet the farm, okay? It's one thing if you bet the farm and your farm is $1,000. But when you're talking about don't bet the farm, when you've got a company and you've got momentum and you think that you're gonna pivot and you bet the farm there, that's a fool. 
That's a fool that does that because if things go sideways, now you're out of business and it's not just your life you've affected, but you've affected the lives of, you know, in my case, hundreds of families that were banking on me making the right decision every day. Yeah. You know, you got to be on yourself. So you mentioned, and yes, I, I, you know, as my company's grow, you know, my company now is officially bigger than any company, any business I've had in the past. And it is, is, it is really powerful. The, the weight and the awareness of all of these people's lives, right. That, that are basically depending on me to not be a jackass every day, right. Right. Um, get every day and, and fight the good fight on their behalf. Exactly. And so I'm curious, you know, as you mentioned, fitness is at many levels a commodity, right? There's weights and there's gravity and you push one against the other. Um, so, and you, you saw, say it comes down to community and culture uh, what was your MO, especially scaling a business that fast? How did you create and control and, and scale culture in a way that, you know, where you had the same energy at 2000 locations that you did at, at two? Well, and that's the challenge with, with, with franchises, because you're only as good as your weakest franchisee. Yeah. Where you can give them, you can give them the, the right equipment selection. You can help them with their real estate selection. But at the end of the day, um, you know, they go through extensive training at our office through, through Snap Fitness University. But at the end of the day, they, you know, they've got to they got to get up every day and make people feel loved. They got to get up every day and deliver on the promise. I mean, let's face it. Most people walk into a gym and they say, look, you know, if, if, in today's day and age, let, uh, uh, assuming you have great equipment, if you don't have great equipment in your gym today, you have no chance anyway. OK, right. so ground zero is the equipment is in great working order. The club is clean. All right. And, and uh, th- th- then now where the variables are, your staff needs to be friendly and customer service. They got to lean into the customers and they got to be able to have a basic understanding of nutrition and exercise and how to blend the two to yield a result. Okay. You got to get people to the promised land of whatever their wellness journey looks like. And every, everyone's walk is going to be different. And if your narrative is not set up in a way where it's easily interpreted by the layman person, then you're, you're going to fail. Because then once you have that, because there's also all kinds of tools that will allow you to, to keep people accountable. You can track their attendance. There's little flags that go off. You can call them, say, hey, Jeff, I haven't seen you in a few days. Is everything okay? I mean, little things that I can do to keep you coming into the club because that retention for you as a member matters to me. So that's just ground zero in the space. You hope that everyone does it, but the reality of it is, Jeff, some people, they think they're made out for business and they're not. That's the truth. Do you have a specific methodology, uh, you know, for, in your case, attracting great franchisees that I assume would also apply to hiring great employees, but like, that's the hardest thing I've found is to kind of, you know, in a relatively short period of time, qualitatively evaluate a human being for values. Uh, yeah. What's your process? Well, it's, it, now that's a difficult because some people, they're really good. They talk a great game. Yeah. Yeah. They, they talk a great game. They look, they're, they're a great brand fit. Um, they talk a great game. They're very knowledgeable. They've got the enthusiasm. When you're talking to them about running the business and, and the secret components, the secret sauce that make, that's going to make their club special, they almost finish the sentence for you, right? So they're on point. But it gets right down to, to grit, okay, which is just such yeah. one of my favorite words. If, if you don't have the stomach for it, you know, if you're owning a gym, if you think that you're going to be a gym owner, and as soon as you walk in, people drop their weights and they start applauding and start singing for he's the jolly good fellow. If you think that's what it's like to own a gym, turn and run because it's not that. Literally, it's, you know, you've got to, it's, you're, you're just a business owner. You got to be, you got to be humble. You got to make sure your club is clean. You got to be willing to pick up that paper towel that's sitting on the floor. You got to be willing to, you know, to, to, to wipe down the bathroom floor. You got to be willing to do it all. You know what I mean? Because if, if at the end of the day, if you don't do it as the owner, nobody's going to do it. So you, you, you want to have people to, to fall in line with their roles and their responsibilities and be accountable for it. But if they don't, the alternative is not to get someone else. If you want great leadership, if you want people to walk on fire for you, you got to be willing to toe the line in any position within the company. So how do you, I mean, it, it, it sounds like, and I have a, one of my best friends actually used to own a gym and I know, 
how exhausting it was. I know how much work it was. I know how, on, frankly, how little money he made. And some of that may just be the fundamentals of his chosen business model or his location or whatever. But I, you know, I, I think it's safe to say it's a lot of work. Um, and so I'm curious for you, what was your schedule like during that time you were scaling that business? Like, how did you, you manage yourself? Well, I tried to, and I, you know what, I probably, I, I could have managed it better, Jeff, to be honest with you, because I, you know what, I was, I would get up in the morning. I usually roll out of bed at around six or six thirty. And one thing that I never do, I'm not, I don't set alarms. Okay. okay. So but I always naturally get up between six and six and six forty five, I get up every day. So I roll out of bed because I feel if I need the rest, I'm going to take it. Right. Mm -hmm. And then, and then I roll into work. I'm, I'm showing up there by eight o'clock in the morning, sometimes usually about seven 30 in the morning. And then I'm there average till five to six. And, but if it has to be later, it has to be later. And if I've got client dinners or calls at that night where I've got to participate in a, in a franchise call of some sort, I do that. You're, you're always available. And that's one thing, owning a business, you got to be saying, I always told people, look, I'm available seven days a week, 24 hours a day. Because when I would sell a master franchise to someone in India or Australia, I would let those people, they're, they're paying me a lot of money to be able to fly my flag, my banner. Mm -hmm. And I wanted them to know, hey, look, number one, first of all, I, I appreciate you and I appreciate your, 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 your commitment to our brand and I'm going to be there for you. So if you have any questions at all, um, feel free to call me directly. Now I'm talking to the president of that, of that company who's going to fly my brand. So it's not like I was having his employees call me, but, and I would get calls and emails and whatnot from people all hours of the day, all hours of the night. It didn't matter because to me that came with, that comes with the turf of trying to build a brand. Now, once again, I didn't, I didn't set out to open 10 clubs. You know what I mean? Right. When, when I had momentum, I said, you know what? I want to, I want to, I want to be a national brand. As soon as I was moving down that path of being a national brand, I said, I wanted to be international. And, you know, I just kept every time I got to my milestone and, and then the, this is a great lesson for all of your entrepreneurs out there. You have to visualize where it is you want to go and you have to kind of stake that, put that stake in the sand, but then set milestones along the way, because in some cases, like in my first journey, it took me 20 years. You, you have to set milestones because when you hit these milestones along the way, you, you can see movement and movement is, is motivating and inspiring to yourself. Otherwise, you, there's a chance you'll lose interest. Yeah. So for me, as soon as I became a national brand, I immediately pivoted and said, I want to be an international brand. And, and you know, I didn't know how big international would be, but we add countries every year. So today, like I said, it's roughly 28 countries. We're, we're now expanding into Japan and, and going into cultures that are very, very different and diverse from what, from what I, I grew up in. But it's, uh, you know, health and wellness, it's a universal language. Yeah. Everybody's into it today. Yeah. And I think that's so important for entrepreneurs to realize that like, you don't, you don't really get that many wins. And when you no. get one, you got to see it all the way through. Like if you, if you're winning, don't get bored, do whatever you got to do to keep yourself interested. So you'll take it all the way because you could go 20 years without another win. And it doesn't mean you're wrong. It just means the market's different or, but when you hit the vein, you got to pull all the gold out of it. You're exactly right. That's a great point. You're exactly right. When you are, when you are on a, a, a rocket. Now, for me, I knew I had lightning in a bottle, yeah. so I did just that. I had laser focus. I was not thinking about anything else other than building, selling franchises, and opening stores. That was my focus. And and there's so many people that lose that. I I, I feel sorry for people. They they start having some success. They're bankrolling money, and instead of doubling down, they they take the, the the yields, the proceeds from their business that's growing. They up they upgrade their house. They, rather than grow, right. sending it back into the business, they have a bigger house. The the vacations become much much more luxurious, and and they become complacent. And rather than just saying, "Look, I'm going to suck it up for the next five years and let's see how it goes," and then after five years, let, let's take a look and see. But I mean, if you're not careful, you wake up one year and, you, and you've got five, $10 million in the bank. And, and now you can put that to work for you. And that's going to be life changing for you, right? Yeah. That passive income is going to make a difference in your life. Yeah. And, and, you know, I mean, we keep talking about Buffett. You know, he also talks a lot about staying in your circle of competence. 
Um, you know, I think it's interesting. You, you made some money as a fitness guy and you didn't take the money and go, oh, sweet. Now I'm going to go do hydroponics. You said, okay, I'm going to stick in my lane that I know yeah. and try to go even bigger. Yeah. And that's, uh, that's what I did. So Lyft Brands is the, is the, is the, the, the fundamental company underneath Lyft Brands, a Snap Fitness, Nine Round Fitness on Demand, and, and then a few other smaller brands. Mm -hmm. but that, that, that is Lyft Brands. But now that I've stepped away, my, my goal is the only things that I do, I do things that bring me joy. So I own a lodge in the Serengeti a five-star lodge in the Serengeti. I love that. I'm in the music business. I hold, I host a music festival in Minneapolis every year, the third week in July. Those are things that bring me joy. Um, I own a manufacturing company that, that creates biodegradable pellets that put it, that I put in injection moldings for everything from, from um, planters for pots or you, you name it. Right? So that's what, that's what brings me joy. But with all of that said, I never, I never take the fundamentals. So I never have more than 20% of my net worth in th these areas of where I'm not an expert, okay? Mm -hmm. Because to, to your point earlier, Jeff, making money and winning, it's really hard, yeah. okay? And you know, for me, if I lose a million dollars, I have to make 2 million to save a million. Yeah. Okay? So think about that. I make $2 million, the, Uncle Sam gets half. Right. So that's just how it works. And uh, so just th think about it. making those dollars. It's, you know, I don't like losing money in, in big chunks like that. Yeah. A amen. Um, well, listen, this has been an amazing conversation. I uh, I'm so grateful you came on the show and I wish we both didn't have somewhere else we need to get to, or we could keep going, but uh, this has been great. Uh, congratulations on all your amazing success yes. from, uh, college dropout racquetball player to, you know, you're, you're clearly you're an overnight success, right? It just, it just happened for you. So. Yeah, it was, it was just a, a lot of hard work and it worked out. You know, I tell people, look, and that's why I think today, why I'm, I try to be relatable that, that anything is possible. And, um, and I'm living proof of it, that the American dream is alive and well, if you're just willing to lean in, lean in and, and with a lot of grit and hard work and sacrifice, you can do it. Well said. So uh, where can people that are, you know, salivating for more, go get more Peter Taunton? Because do they find you on social? Yeah. The best place to find me is really on Instagram. And, and it's Peter underscore Taunton, T-A-U-N-T-O-N. That's the best place to find me. Follow me on Instagram. I, I, I look at it every day, multiple times a day. So if you ask me a question, I'll respond back. It's me responding back to you. So, you know, at this point in time, I, I, I still manage that piece of it for me because it, it puts me in touch with people. And, uh, you know, I've just got a lot of exciting things going on with my Forbes masterclass that's coming out here. And, and I have a book coming out in a couple of months as well. Wonderful. Well, uh, yeah, make sure to let our team know. I'll, I'll, I'll want to sure. read it and I'll, I'll uh, share it with the audience. Yeah, thanks. Thanks, Jeff. I really appreciate having on. You had great, great questions and, and congrats on your success. It's always, it's always fun to hear someone else who's just grinding it out and making it happen. Well, I appreciate it. Likewise to you. Thanks so much for being on the show. Thank you to all viewers and listeners of Millionaire Secrets. You guys and gals are the best part of this show and you're why I do what I do every day. I'll see you on the next one. Thank you for watching Millionaire Secrets. If you enjoyed this episode, please share it with your friends and leave us a comment below. And don't forget to subscribe and turn on notifications so you know whenever we release a new episode. Also, if you wanna learn the fastest way to become a millionaire in the new economy, click the link in the description below to claim your free copy of my book, The Millionaire Shortcut. And don't forget, Millionaire Secrets is available on all the major podcast platforms as well. Subscribe wherever you listen to podcasts so you can listen on the go. Thanks for watching.